Well, take your Bible this evening. I just want to read a passage of Scripture that we, they base the story of the play on. It's in Ephesians chapter 2, and it's verses 5 through 8. Ephesians 2, and verses 5 through 8, if you would please. Since it's, it's kind of a one long sentence here, we'll just read it in unison together. But let's stand together, all right? We'll all stand to read God's Word, and let's read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 of Philippians chapter 2, beginning on verse 5. Ready? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight, and Lord, again, we thank you for what we have heard and seen this evening. And I pray, Lord, that now as we look at this passage and we just share a few thoughts about how you gave everything, that, Lord, you'd minister to our hearts and continue to speak to us as you have begun to speak to us through the cantata. And I pray, Lord, that we would go out in a few minutes saying it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord this evening and that God spoke to my heart. Lord, help us. In these next few moments together as we look into your word, in Jesus' name I ask it, amen. All right, you may be seated. Notice it says, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery equal with God, he made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and then in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. We call this Jesus emptying himself. Now he didn't empty himself of his deity, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but this is the what we call the doctrine of the incarnation. God becoming flesh. God coming and dwelling with man. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we're going to talk a little bit about he gave himself. In the midst of this admonition that Paul gives to the church at Philippi, and he loved this church, he's encouraging them about treating one another, loving one another, not letting anything be done through strife and vainglory, not anybody trying to get the attention, anyone trying to be selfish, but esteem others better than themselves. And to illustrate that truth, to help them understand the truth, the illustration he gives is that of the Lord Jesus himself. For he is the best example we could ever have. And if we're going to be like that, then we have to have this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the way we can treat each other like we ought to be treated. That's the problem, by the way, in America. We want, we want to love our neighbor. We're, we're trying to get people to love their neighbor as themselves, but we're, we've left out the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. If you don't do the first one, you're not going to get the second one. That's why we have problems with people loving one another. is because we've lost our love for God. And so we're going to follow Jesus' example of humility. In other words, Paul would tell them, if you need a picture of what it looks like to live the way I'm exhorting you to live, here's your example. Here's your picture. It's the life of Jesus Christ, and it's a mindset. This, that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus, as we talked about this morning, was God. He's the mighty God. He was God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. He was God the Son even before the Incarnation. When God said, let us make man in our image in the book of Genesis, He made man a three-part being because He's a triune God. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Paul here writes and says that Jesus was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. The word form there means he's the very essence of God. And he didn't think that was wrong to be the essence of God because that's who he was. He embraced perfect humanity, but he also in, and never lost his absolute deity. You say, was he, was he half God and half man? No, he was still 100% God and he was 100% man. He never lost that. In fact, it was his claim to deity that caused the rulers to want to kill him. They wanted to stone him because he claimed to be God. Thought he was accusing him of blasphemy. Jesus always was God. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So he came and his incarnation in the form and the essence and the nature of God himself. Despite the fact he took on flesh. Despite the fact he condescended voluntarily to become like one of us. He had the, that, that mystical union of the two natures of God and man. And he became, the Bible says, a servant. He appeared in the likeness of men, like you and me. He emptied himself. He made himself nothing. The Bible says he made himself of no reputation. Some who have power or wealth or authority want to hang on to it at all costs. You think about some of the dictators we've known in the world. They uh, hang on for as long as they can until revolutions take place or revolutionaries have to kill them to get them removed. Otherwise, they're not leaving on their own power. But we have Jesus who, by the way, had all the wealth and all the power and all the authority, much more than any earthly king could ever have, and yet he lays that aside and comes to earth and makes himself of no reputation. He created everything. Everything belongs to Him. And yet, He didn't bring that into the world and demand that everybody admit that to Him. He made Himself of no reputation. He voluntarily emptied Himself of those things. He could have remained on the throne at the right hand of the Father. But he came to earth. The Word became flesh. He gave everything. He emptied himself. His rightful place was glory. His rightful place would be at the right hand of the Father. He was, from the ages begun, he was continually receiving praise and adoration and glory from the angels and the heavenly beings. We cannot begin to imagine what it was like for the Son of God in heaven. The fellowship he had with God the Father. The adoration he had by the seraphims and the cherubims. And he chose to lay that aside for 33 years and come here and live among us. To suffer. To die for us. He became obedient unto death, it says. He who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, died. He who is the life suffered death. He is the resurrection was stilled in death. We don't often think or like to think about the suffering of Jesus Christ. It was the middle of the night when Judas came with the soldiers to the garden and he betrays Jesus with a kiss. They arrest Jesus and he's led to the Sanhedrin and the high priest Caiaphas. When Jesus is quiet, being questioned by Caiaphas, one of the soldiers takes his fist and punches Jesus in the face for remaining silent while being questioned by the high priest. Palace guards then blindfold him and taunt him as they pass by him. 
and strike him in the face or spit upon him. It's now the wee hours of the morning on Wednesday morning. Jesus, tired and battered and bruised and dehydrated, has now been up for over 24 hours. He's taken across the city to the praetorium to face Pilate. There, in response to the people, Pilate releases Barabbas, a known murderer, and condemns Jesus to scourging and crucifixion. Roman law always dictated that before the condemned person was crucified, they had to be scourged. Scourging or flogging might be a term you're more familiar with. It was a terrible thing to endure. In fact, many prisoners did not endure it. The prisoner is stripped of his clothing. His hands are tied to a post above his head. And a Roman soldier then steps up with the scourge to begin the whipping. That scourge was a wooden handle with strips of leather, pieces of bone and metal attached to it with some lead balls embedded into the leather. His back would be stretched. And the Roman soldiers were trained in this, using this cat of nine tails, they would call it, this scourging tool. And they had special training to know just how to bring it down across the back of the prisoner and pull it across his back. Till the skin would begin to rip and tear and shred off the back of the prisoner. As the blows would cut deeper and deeper into the sub-tissues, pretty soon blood would begin to spurt from the blood vessels. And eventually the internal organs would be exposed. The soldiers were very hardened men and they, they were used to doing this kind of punishment. And they seemed to know just how far to go before getting someone right to the brink of death before relenting. Jesus endured that suffering before He ever went to the cross. Then the soldiers did something else. They had made a crown of thorns. Thorns that are not just, just small thorns, but I think somewhere between 6 inches and 10 inches in length. And they made a crown of those thorns, and the Bible says they didn't just set it on his head, they beat it down into his head. Blood flowed down his head. They proceed to slap Jesus around and mock him. Jesus never fought back. Jesus never retaliated. Not only did He have to face the beating and the mocking, He had to carry His own cross. The typical journey that they would go to from the place of judgment out to the place of crucifixion was a procession there would be a centurion on horseback. There would be a herald who would proclaim the sentence as well as why the condemned man was about to die. The condemned man would be behind the herald and behind the condemned man four more soldiers. And of course, people would line the streets to see the procession out to Golgotha. And he would have to endure the ridicule and the comments from the crowd. There's a rough-hewn beam of wood shaped like a cross. It's tied across his shoulders. And the condemned men begin their slow 650-yard journey to Golgotha. The weight of the wood beam the loss of blood, the lack of sleep, proves to be too much. Jesus stumbles and falls. The rough beam of wood gouging into his lacerated skin. He tries to get up, but the muscles 
must be pushed beyond their limit. So they get a man in the crowd, Simon of Cyrene by name, to carry his cross. The whole scene was meant to further humiliate the condemned man. I, I, I cannot imagine God looking down and seeing His Son being treated that way. With each step, Jesus is getting closer to making the final sacrifice for sin. With each step He takes, He's losing more blood. With each step He takes, His life is going from Him. But as they arrive at Golgotha, the place of the skull just outside of Jerusalem, the beam is laid on the ground and Jesus is thrown backward, His shoulders against that beam. The Roman soldiers will feel for the depression right in the wrist area. And they move quickly. And they drive a heavy spike right through that wrist into the wood. They move to the other side and do the same to the other hand. The left foot is then pressed down back against the right foot. Both feet extend downward and a nail is driven through the arch of each. The soldier then lifts up the cross and drops it into a prepared hole with a thud. And the bones come out of joint. The only way to breathe is the prisoner has to try to push himself up with those nails through his feet to try to get a little air into his lungs. Jesus pushes himself up to avoid the stretching torment Hours of pain, joint-rending cramps, partial asphyxiation, exposed tissue on his back pushing up and down on that rough wood beam. But Jesus wasn't on the cross pleading with people. Jesus, he wasn't on the cross defending himself. He didn't shout out that everything, all this is wrong, what are you doing? He went to the cross for our sins. He knew why he came. He came to die. He knew why he was there. There were seven total sayings on the cross and the last one when Jesus gathers all He can for one final push. You can imagine the pain that is searing through His body. And He says, Father, into Thy hands I commend My Spirit. He gave His life for you and me. He gave everything. The soldiers, as you remember, to make double sure of death, came and drove a spear underneath his rib, up into his heart, and there came out blood and water. He gave everything. The beating, the scourging, the whip on his back, the bearing of the cross, the nails in his hands, his feet, the spear in his side, the agony and the torment. Why, why did he go through all that? He went through all of that for you and for me. Because he loves us. He didn't want us to suffer for our sin. So he suffered for our sin. He didn't want us to be punished for our sin before a just God. So he was punished in our place. For God hath made Him to be sin for us when He knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 15, who hath reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ. Hey, Jesus didn't just die on the cross so you and I wouldn't go to hell. 
He died on the cross that we might be reconciled to God. That we might be brought back to Him. That we could have fellowship with God restored in our life once again. You're not fulfilling the purpose of your life if you just accept Jesus Christ and say, well, good, I got my get out of hell free card. No, He saved you that you might have fellowship with God so that you might have a relationship with Him. He can restore that fellowship. He came that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. He died that we might live to the praise of His glory, as Ephesians tells us. That henceforth, uh, we would not live unto ourselves, but unto Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. Well, you just, you, you, you just think you can accept Christ and live any way you want to? No. No. Can't do that. There's something when you receive Christ, when you think about He gave everything. I want to live for Him. I want to live for His glory. I don't want to live as I want. I want to live as He wants. I want to live to do my will. I want to live to do His will. He gave everything. I want to give everything to Him. When you stand before Him one day, and all of us will, He's not going to look for medals. He's not looking for scars or, or for degrees or diplomas. He's looking for your scars. And when I get to heaven, I believe we'll see the scars that Jesus bore for us. He gave everything. If He gave everything, can't you live for Him? If He gave everything, can't we be faithful to Him? If He gave everything, can't I get up and fellowship with Him every morning? Can I give God the first part of every day? Can I live my life to be pleasing to Him? The songwriter said, I gave my life for Thee, my precious blood I shed, that, I might ransom, that Thou might ransom to be and raised from the dead. I gave, I gave, my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave, my life for thee, what hast thou given for me? He gave everything. What have you given to him? Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this evening. Lord, thank you for what we heard in song and drama. Thank you, Lord, for the example we've seen in the Lord Jesus. We understand what it means that he gave everything. I, I cannot imagine, I cannot comprehend what Jesus Christ went through. I know Hollywood has tried to depict it. I don't think they come close. Thank you for giving everything. Thank you for laying down your life that we might have eternal life. Thank you for paying the price of sin so that we might enjoy fellowship with the Father and a home in heaven one day. Father, I'm asking you tonight that there'd be many in this room who would say, He gave everything for me. I will give everything to Him. I'm bought with a price. I will glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's. That I will henceforth not live unto myself, but I will live unto Him who loved me and gave Himself for me.